Welcome to The Daily Brief. Black Lives Matter turns 10 years this month. And today we're going to have a discussion about the ups, the downs, the successes, and the triumphs of an organization that has turned into a movement for Black liberation. And joining us now is one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter, Dr. Melina Abdullah. Welcome to, well, back to The Daily Brief. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Can you tell us about how the organization formulated? Sure. So people know the story of the naming of Black Lives Matter, that Alicia Garza wrote a love letter to Black people Mm -hmm. the day that Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin. And she signed that letter, Black Lives Matter. Patrice Cullors then puts a hashtag in front of it. And so there's this online kind of effort. Right. But we also have to remember that what we did in the name of Trayvon Martin wasn't just online. So here in Los Angeles, um, you know, before there were blue gates around Lamert Park, um, that was where we went every time we wanted to celebrate voice Mm -hmm. outrage. We didn't need a post on social media to tell us, you know, when Zimmerman was acquitted in the murder of Trayvon Martin to all convene there. So July 13th, 2013 was really the starting point of what um, Professor Brenda Stevenson calls intuitive organizing, Mm. right? So we flooded the streets, and I was one of the people who flooded the streets with my children in tow, um, bringing my students, who I call my spirit babies, with me, Mm -hmm. right? And we were part of shutting things down all across the city in the name of Trayvon Martin for a period of three days. On that third day of constant protest, um, I received a text from Patrice Cullors, and she encouraged us to come meet in St. Elmo Village, which is this beautiful, magical Black artist community Mm -hmm. in mid-city Los Angeles. I came with about a dozen of my students and friends, and she was there with her organizer and artist friends and I always say under the light of the moon and I don't remember if there was actually a moon but in my (laughs) imagination there was right what we did was pledge to build a movement not a moment and now 10 years in um, we're making good on that promise it kind of really exploded with the murder of George Floyd In that moment, the organization began to take shifts and turns. The Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation evolved, and they went that way. And then we had Black Lives Matter grassroots. And we know that there's something happening, lawsuits and things. Can you kind of break down, like, what happened and what's the status? Do you guys still work together? Absolutely not. We do not work with the Global Network Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, Black Lives Matter grew to be about 40 chapters globally. Okay. And we were tied together um, beginning in 2015. We began to do organized um, and uh, kind of concerted actions where all of our chapters would participate in the same thing. Patrice, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi were absolutely a part of the birthing of Black Lives Matter. And they weren't the only ones, right? right? Mm -hmm. I think about people like Sister Jan, who came into the movement in 2015. She was a school bus driver, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I think about Mama Paula, who has had an entire career with the city of Los Angeles, retired, and then said, oh, no, I can't leave this world to my grandkids. So Black Lives Matter was birthed, built, and is fueled by just regular people. So from 2013 to 2020, You know, all of us were just doing the work. None of us were paid organizers, Mm -hmm. right? In 2020, we weren't expecting the world to be cracked wide open. Um, But the murders of Breonna Taylor, Mm -hmm. of Ahmaud Arbery, and of course, George Floyd cracked the world wide open. And what we saw was people who couldn't look away from the television. Patrice, who was um, had formed the Global Network Foundation, decided that the Global Network Foundation could deal with kind of the back office piece of an organization that's now seven years old. The organizers on the ground, and I was one of the lead organizers on the ground in Los Angeles, formed Black Lives Matter grassroots because we wanted to stay connected and push the movement on the ground forward. We had trust in Patrice, um, who you know, had set up mechanisms to receive money and then grant that money back out to chapters and other aligned organizations. 
And then all of the attacks of 2020 happened. And Patrice was attacked. I was attacked. Right. Folks outside of Black Lives Matter, like Tamika Mallory, were attacked. I said, I got a thick skin. I'm from the hood. Right? Right, so, right. you know, you can type on Twitter if you want to, but mm-hmm. it's not going to stop me from doing work, right? Patrice, by 2021, it had really weighed on her and she stepped back from the Global Network Foundation. There was an initial plan for a movement, folks to take over the foundation, but the legal mechanisms had been left in the power of a highly paid consultant who I don't mind naming names. His name is Shalomia Bowers, or he goes by Shalomia Bowers and Bowers Consulting. And basically what he did was refuse to show Makani, Tamba, and Monifa uh, Bandele any of the books. So they said, I don't want to take this. Then Patrice wrote a plan, well, let's just transition all of the resources over to the boots on the ground right. and let grassroots receive everything. I was already um, doing all the political um, kind of um, positioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by that is saying this is what we believe in as an abolitionist pan-Africanist organization, right? That was all kind of under my tent. I was also running most of the social media. Mm-hmm. And so um, she said, let's move the resources over to the grassroots side. Right. Bowers decided one day in March of 2022, oh, I'm not giving you anything. And I'm keeping this indefinitely. Those were the words he spoke to me. And where's Patrice at in all of this? Patrice had stepped back. She had. So that uh, means that she had no say any longer in what the, the Global Network Foundation was doing. As far as I know, now I want to be very clear, I've never had my hands in the Global Network Foundation. So as far as I know, according to Patrice, she had no legal authority anymore. She clearly had some moral authority because the end of that call with Bowers was, he said to me, I hope I'm not going to have to hear about this from Patrice. And I said, oh, you're absolutely going to have to hear about this from Patrice because the next call I made was to Patrice. Mm -hmm. And there had been a history of consultants kind of being hired Mm -hmm. to move vision forward, move the vision Patrice had forward. And so there had been another terrible consultant before Bowers um, named Kylie Scales and our chapters were up in arms about her. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reassurances that Patrice gave us is, oh, he's nothing like Kylie. And what it turns out to be is he was far worse because at the time he took over the organization, Black Lives Matter was worth, I would estimate, to be over $100 million. Wow, what's it worth now? I don't know. I, I've only seen the 990s that everybody else has seen, mm-hmm. and it sounds like maybe half that, maybe $50 million. Oh, wow. Wow, yeah. wow, wow. Um, you brought up the word abolitionist. Um, a lot of people in the black community are like, well, that's going too far. Why are you an abolitionist? And what do you want to see happen when you say that that's what you are? We are abolitionists in the same vein that Mama Harriet Tubman was an abolitionist, right? That mm-hmm. she didn't say, you know what, let's um, let's reform chattel slavery, <laughs> you know? Right, right. We gotta end chattel slavery. That's what Mama Harriet was committed to doing and using every tool in her toolbox, in our collective toolbox, to end chattel slavery. If we're students of history, we know that policing is actually a vestige of chattel slavery, that policing, and this is indisputable, no matter what side of the political spectrum you're on, mm-hmm. well, policing in this country hails from chattel slavery. So if you have to upend chattel slavery, you have to upend policing as we know it. That doesn't mean we upend public safety. So what does public safety look like to you? When I talk about public safety, I mean, and we mean, flooding our community with resources. The safest communities are the communities with the most resources, not the most police. When they respond to something, less than 3% of what they're responding to are actual emergencies. Mm. What police are responding to 97% of the time are things like noise complaints. Oh, the party's too loud next door. You know, if we build strong communities, you know how to walk next door and go night, night, night. Hey, the baby's trying to sleep. Do you mind turning it down? Or I'm lonely. 
Can I come to the party too? <laughs> right? Right, right, right. And so those are the things that we want to work on. All right. And, and so uh, let's take it a step further. What about our um, prison system? There's parts of prisons and um, jails that can be completely abolished right now today. We know that community, um, the vast majority of the American public, and this is across racial lines, moves with us when we say we want to abolish youth prisons. Right. That children do not belong in cages. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, we can begin with that. We can also extend that to when we think about the number of people who are incarcerated for non-crimes, for what many systems call enhancements, mm -hmm. right? That's a whole nother population that should be immediately released. And when we talk to district attorneys, um, many progressive district attorneys are now moving to release those who were incarcerated as children and being held on nothing but enhancements. We can think about the recent passing of Matulu Shakur, mm -hmm. who was held in prison for more than 30 years and held as an elder, right, mm -hmm. as a political prisoner. Here's where you get some pushback from people, is when you talk, about, talk with people about those who have committed violent crimes, right? They're really kind of tentative about what you do with those folks. But those folks are a very, very small portion right. of who's actually in prison. And if we think about community investment, if we think about, you know, making sure that every child grows up you know, having supports, having strong schools, right. having um, all of the things that they need and most of what they want, you also get to um, stopping violent crime before it happens. Right. It's, it's just not one answer. It, right. it, it's like um, you have to change the entire system, which is why we push so much of we have to get rid of systemic racism because it's all interwoven. Um, uh, looking to the future, what are your hopes and aspirations for Black Lives Matter? Hopes and aspirations are that Black Lives Matter continues to grow, even in the midst of this struggle. Black Lives Matter chapters are growing. Right. So we are 26 chapters within the United States, including two prison chapters. Mm. Um, and then by the end of uh, the month, will be at 33 chapters with many, many other chapters onboarding. What we're finding is that people are recognizing that we can't stop struggling because 2020 has passed, because elected officials are no longer painting Black Lives Matter in the streets. Right. That Black Lives Matter is a movement, not a moment. It's a fundamental necessity for Black liberation. And so my hope is that Black Lives Matter continues to grow and that um, those who are stepping into it, especially the young people who are most visionary and audacious, mm -hmm. continue to push down the road. I love what they're doing with Black Lives Matter in schools, mm -hmm. which is a really abolitionist frame. I love how families are now um, really intertwining with Black Lives Matter, saying, mm -hmm. we don't need you to just fight for us. We need you to fight with us. And so, you know, we have a Black Lives Matter chapter in Florida that's our first family-led chapter, oh, okay. um, led by the, fa the family of Andrew Joseph III. What Black Lives Matter has done over the last 10 years is really push being unapologetically Black. Mm. And we see it permeate beyond the chapters as well. Um, I think that this is what we see with ethnic studies, with, you know, diversity, mm -hmm. equity and inclusion, which is now facing a backlash. Mm -hmm. My hope for the next 10 years is mm -hmm. that we'll continue to grow and reach every corner of this world. A lot of times people say, oh, they just show up for protests. But I want you to touch on um, some of the policy moves that you've made over the past 10 years and those successes. Um, so we have a federal piece of policy that we're moving right now the Ending Qualified Immunity Act with um, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley has introduced that act in the name of Andrew Joseph III, who was just 14 years old mm -hmm. when he was killed in Tampa, Florida, as a result of police misconduct. In California, we have the Kenneth Ross Jr. Police Decertification Act, named in honor of Kenneth Ross Jr., who was murdered by a Gardena police officer. That cop had already um, shot three people 
in another police force, mm. right? And then when he was lost his job in Orange County, he was able to then get a job in Gardena where he went on to murder Kenneth Ross Jr. Mm. So the, the act named in honor of Kenneth Ross Jr. says you don't get to hop from force to force. Right. You're going to be decertified. And we've already decertified more than 50 police, including the police, um, Torrance police officers who murdered Christopher DeAndre Mitchell. So that's policy work that we're moving in. Our very first piece of policy was actually an ethnic studies bill that made ethnic studies a requirement in the California State University system that was authored by Shirley Weber, who's now our Secretary of State, our brilliant Secretary of State. We don't often stand up and applaud elected officials, but if we go applaud one, she's one. And Mm -hmm. so those are policy pieces that we've already won. Um, And we have many more. Um, We're trying to remove police from traffic stops. works like that, uh, remove police from mental health calls, right? And all other places that they don't belong. So that's policy work that we're right, right. So how can the black community support Black Lives Matter? So I always say there's three things that you can do. We need your voice. We need you to amplify Black Lives Matter grassroots. That means following us on social media at BLM Grassroots. It also means being very clear when you hear stories about million dollar mansions, you say, Oh, no, that wasn't them. That was the Global Network Foundation, right? Black Lives Matter grassroots is Black Lives Matter. We're the movement on the ground. We need you to talk about that at your dinner tables, at your jobs, everywhere. The second thing that we need is your body. And that means showing up, right? And so don't wait for somebody else to say, you know what? LAPD killed someone else on Sunday night. They did. They killed someone else. This is their 10th murder. Right. Mm -hmm. We need your body. We need you to show up at the L.A. Police Commission meetings on Tuesdays. We need you to roll with us all the way to Lancaster and boycott Winco Foods. Right. Right, right, right. Um, Which was complicit in the brutalization of our people. So the sheriff who um, and it was only after exposure. Right. Because the story protest after Mm protest. So we marched into Winco Foods. They had never seen anything. I saw the video. Yeah. (laughs) We were like, we want a manager. But when we shut them down that afternoon and the next day, it did bring attention and forced Sheriff Luna to remove um, the deputy who body slammed mm-hmm. this black woman elder cancer patient, mm-hmm. right, um, removed from duty. And so he's not yet fired, but he's removed from duty. So protest does work, but we need people to help us protest. Right, so right. we need you to put your body on the line and show up. Um, it doesn't mean that you always have to be the chanter or the yeller. You know, some of the things that we do is we just have people sometimes just sitting and um, holding space and praying for us. And then the third thing that we need, and I'm gonna just be straight up, they stole all our money. And so we do need resources and that looks like dollars. We need to feed our people. We need water for our people. One of our small black owned businesses, Katula, which is an African clothing store, called me yesterday and said, well, what can we offer? And I said, all these families are flying in. All these people are speaking and performing. We're not paying any of them. Can you just give us 200 of something to give to these people? And they said, yeah, we can do that. We can give you, you know, 200 small items to put in your gift bags. Nice. We asked a black owned Krispy Kreme. They said, yeah, we got you. We'll give you donut certificates. And so when we talk about resources, we mean dollars and we're thankful for black organizations like Social Justice Learning Institute who donated $5,000 that they be struggling to get to make this festival happen. But it also means other things, Mm -hmm. right? So those are the three things, voice, body, and resources. Wow. Um, Well, I just personally want to thank you for 10 years of being on the front line. Um, I always say sometimes, while we're at home sleeping, it's really people that are really intentionally working for the liberation of black folks. And you know, I am a huge fan of yours just because of who you are and what you do. Mm -hmm. And you sometimes are more unapologetic for us than we know how to be for ourselves. And so I appreciate you you. and Black Lives Matter for that. Thank you. And I appreciate you. And I should say, you know, the way that you show up, 
with the tools that you have and the resources that you have, if everybody did that, we'd be free. Well, we're getting there. Yeah. We're getting there. Yeah, that's <laughs> All right. Happy anniversary. Thank you. Um, love you. Love and you for the latest in black news, you want to head on over to lasentinel.net, where you know there is a space for Black Lives Matter. Uh, I'm Neo Anderson, and you have just been debriefed. Debriefed.